Hello, and greetings from Stratford upon Avon, where we are preparing to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday. Thank you to the Shakespeare Festival, Buenos Aires, and Fundación Romeo for inviting us to speak. And especially to our good friend Peter Giorgio. I'm Paul Edmondson. And I'm Stanley Wells. And we're going to speak about our new co authored book, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, published by Cambridge University Press. First of all, why have we called it all the sonnets of Shakespeare? Well, because unlike the very many other existing editions of Shakespeare's sonnets, it includes not just the sonnets that were printed in 1609, but also Shakespeare's other sonnets, that is to say, passages in sonnet form from his plays. There are, of course, many editions of Shakespeare's sonnets, but ours is entirely different and distinctive. By our account there are now 182 sonnets by Shakespeare, 154 from the 1609 collection, 23 from the plays, and five others, three from The Passionate Pilgrim of 1599 and two alternative versions of 1609 sonnets, and we break new ground by putting them into chronological order. So, over the next 30 minutes or so, we want to talk about where the idea came from, about the decisions we had to make about presenting the sonnets, and also about the way that our book affects the ways we might think about Shakespeare's art and about his life. So where did the idea come from? Well, we'd already written a book back in 2004 in which we counter some of the myths about the sonnets, including the assumption that the first 126 sonnets are addressed to a fair youth or a young man, and that the remainder are addressed to a so-called dark lady. We've also produced several articles about the sonnet since then. Yeah, we've continued to challenge the myths about the sonnets over about 20 years, but still we hear speakers refer to the so-called protagonists of the sonnets as if the sonnets represented a coherent sequence which is addressed to only two individuals. We found ourselves often challenging the term sequence, the term the first 126 sonnets, the term the dark lady sonnets. In classes, we hear students and teachers say things along the lines of, this is one of the sonnets addressed to the fair youth. So how we thought about all the sonnets of Shakespeare arises from our long-held position of simply of disagreement with the traditional way of reading the sonnets. About three years ago, we were co-leading a class at the Shakespeare Institute, the University of Birmingham, for their MA in Shakespeare and Creativity. I was speaking about writing sonnets, and Stanley was speaking about approaches to the sonnets, especially in relation to Shakespeare's life. This was when we first started to think about our new book. I recall looking up from my notes on that day and saying, Stanley, wouldn't it be a good idea to arrange the 1609 sonnets in chronological order and intersperse the sonnets from the plays among them? That's never been done before. So one of the points we've been interested in reiterating is that the order in which the sonnets were first printed in 1609 is not the order in which Shakespeare wrote them. For this, we have to thank the New Zealand scholar Macdonald P. Jackson, who has published a number of articles about the chronology of the sonnets over many years. His work shows that Shakespeare was writing the poems included in the 1609 sonnets over a much longer period of time than most readers have tended to assume, that he was writing them indeed over about 27 years. The collection, and we insist on calling it a collection, not a sequence, is not a narrative, it's not a story. It's a gathering together of varied poems, a gathering together that shows intermittent ordering and sequencing within itself, but not as a whole. And then there are the sonnets which help to signal the structure and dialogue or monologues of several plays, including, of course, prologues and epilogues. 
So what were the decisions we had to make about presenting the sonnets? Stanley had already edited the 1609 sonnets for the Oxford edition, and we were given permission to use that. We modified the edition a bit by, for example, removing the capitalization of abstract nouns such as time, partly because of the difficulty of knowing whether they were always intended to be personifications. We looked carefully at Mac Jackson's dating of the sonnets. On page 24 of our new book, we list Jackson's chronological division of the poems. Now, without reading that out, its salient features are that the earliest written sonnets are among the latest printed in 1609, sonnets 127 to 154, and that the latest composed fall between sonnets 104 and 126. So what that means, of course, is that the 1609 collection doesn't at all represent the order in which Shakespeare wrote his sonnets. Now, there are three early cases which we present in our book. Yeah, the first two sonnets in our chronological reordering are, in fact, the last two printed in the 1609 collection, where they're numbered 153 and 154. Why have we reordered these? Well, because... Uh, the 154 is the earlier of the two. Uh, clearly, um, it, it, the 153 then revises that one. And we believe them to be schoolboy exercises, uh, written perhaps at the behest of his schoolmaster, who might well have told him that uh, he needed to revise uh, the, his first shot at them. Uh, they're, both tra they're both translations. They're both translations yeah. from a, 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 a Latin epigram, yes. This has been recognised for a long time, of course, uh, and we believe that he may have revised them later. After those two sonnets, we then print sonnet 145. Now, in 1971, yes, as recently as that, the Shakespeare scholar Andrew Gurr suggested that 145 might be Shakespeare's earliest poem. Well, we think they might be the schoolboy exercises instead. But 145 is a wooing sonnet. It stands apart from the collection because it's an iambic tetrameter, not pentameter. And there's a really interesting play on words in the couplet. Um, the, word, the words hate away I, uh, appear which was an alternative pronunciation of Hathaway, the maiden name of the woman whom Shakespeare married, Anne Hathaway. I hate from hate away she threw and saved my life saying not you. So it could be a premarital or just postmarital uh, poem on Shakespeare's part written when he was only 18. Stanley did the hard work of going through the complete works three times looking for potential sonnet moments within the plays. Nobody seems to have done this before except when referring to the most obviously embedded sonnets. For example, the first meeting of Romeo and Juliet when they fall in love at first sight and share the speaking of a sonnet at the same time. In our earlier book, we included a whole chapter on the 1609 sonnets in relation to the plays and about some of the sonnets in the plays. So how did we choose the passages from the plays? Well, some of them are perfectly straightforward. Prologues, such as the prologue to Romeo and Juliet and the prologue to the first act of Romeo and Juliet. Epilogues, such as the epilogue to Henry V. Uh, in Love's Labour's Lost, there actually Shakespeare portrays people writing sonnets, which they declare to be sonnets. Uh, but... One of them called a sonnet is not what we would in fact recognise as a formal sonnet. The term was rather flexible. Also, one of the 1609 sonnets, when we're thinking about, as it were, non-formal sonnets and the flexibility of the term, one of them has 15 lines, sonnet 99. 126 has 12 lines made up of rhyming couplets. And as I mentioned a moment ago, 145 is in iambic tetrameter, not iambic pentameter. So those might be seen as, as it were, anomalies or flexible sonnets within the 1609 collection. They became alibis, really, for our identifying other potential inclusions from the plays, other, as it were, flexible sonnet forms. Yeah, in the plays we notice several examples of speeches which are set significantly apart 
speech is made up of two quatrains and a couplet, not the 14 lines of the standard sonnet. These shorter versions tend to be speeches that halt the action to reveal the inner state of mind of the characters who speak them, like Beatrice after the overhearing scene, for example, or Orlando in As You Like It, or which, or, or they're sometimes speeches which convey significant information. For example, Valentine's letter to Sylvia, which is intercepted by the Duke of Milan, Sylvia's father, in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. And then there's Cressida's speech from Troilus and Cressida, 14 lines, but in rhyming couplets. And we can relate that to Sonnet 126, because it's made up of couplets. And there are 14 lines, which is what we'd expect from a formal sonnet. She's also alone on stage. Pandrus has just exited, as are Beatrice and Orlando. So it's a moment of intimacy for Cressida. So we included that among the sonnets from the plays. Yeah, and the speech of Helen at the end of the first scene of All's Well that ends well is in a similar form to, to Cressida's. Helen's speech begins, Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. It's a similar moment of self-reflection, of consideration as a soliloquy. And what about Edward III? Well, it includes a scene in which the king, who's a married man, is instructing his secretary in the writing of a love sonnet to the also-married Countess of Salisbury. The scene is perhaps little known because this collaborative play has only been attributed in part to Shakespeare in the last 30 years or so. The scene in question has been attributed to Shakespeare. The king attempts to convey the kind of sonnet he would like his secretary to write, but the king's own poetic impression of the sonnet is not very good. He speaks nine lines, all of which end with the word son, to which he then adds a rhyming couplet. We never actually hear the sonnet the secretary has been trying to write, but in the meantime, Shakespeare has given the king an 11-lined sonnet to speak. Now let's turn to the presentation and the design elements of our book. We think it's beautifully designed. Cambridge University Press have done a lovely job on it. We think it's a handsome hardback. It has lilac endpapers. It has a golden ribbon to show you where you can mark your place, how far you've got in the book. And, and it's not very expensive either. And look at the emphasis on the poems, which we're thrilled about. Centre stage, centre page. The numbers have been removed, so already they look like new poems. The numbers are immediately at the foot of the page, so you can see what, which their numbers were in 1609. Glosses at the foot of the page. And a thumbnail sketch under each sonnet, just to give you enough sense of what it's about before you read the poem, or perhaps to summarise what you've just read. And when we were writing those thumbnail sketches, I remember one day, Stanley, you saying to me, because we would work on individual poems, gloss them, look at each other's work, advise each other on glosses or the presentation of the poem and so on. I remember one day you saying to me, Paul, these are such difficult poems. And I said, Stanley, if you and I think that, what about our readers? And from that day, we decided we were going to do paraphrases, literal paraphrases in prose of all the sonnets, all 182 of them in the book, and those paraphrases appear at the back of the volume. They're deliberately literal because we wanted to convey the awkwardness of some of Shakespeare's poetic expressions and indeed thinking so as not to smooth that over. So in, in a way you can read several paraphrases in modern English prose and get a quick sense of how Shakespeare is thinking, how his mind, how his mind works. We've included indexes to the 1609 numbering, so they can easily be retrieved from within our um, uh, chronological reordering. And we also signal 32 of the sonnets as what we call dramatic analogies, just when they've reminded us about moments in the play, or we perhaps imagine them as characters speaking. So, for example, sonnet 138, where my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, might be, we imagine, Antony speaking to Cleopatra. So just a sort of dramatic suggestiveness uh, as, it's, as it's occurred to us. We've, we've marked that in, in our book. Now, what are some of the effects of what we've done? Well, I think that by abandoning the order in which the 
69 volume printed the sonnets, we've presented the, these sonnets as fresh poems, poems which deserve to be looked at anew in, with, an, uh, with a new eye. Now, we've done that in part, and perhaps mainly, by, we hope, or we know, we've removed the traditional story that I mentioned earlier. And instead, by doing that, by showing that the sonnets don't, well, they never did tell a story in the first place, but the, they, they now definitely don't, as it were, um, by, by doing that, we've emphasised their independence as a collection, as opposed to the sonnet sequences of the 1590s, which are addressed to individuals and are more unified. So we put its great emphasis on the variety of Shakespeare's sonnets. For example, two of them are letters in which he is addressing an individual. Sadly, we can't identify the individual. Those are those are sonnets 26 and 77. One of them is a religious meditation, Shakespeare's only explicitly religious poem. And as we've said, two of them are translations. Only 121 of the 154 sonnets are, are addressed to individuals. And 84 of those 121 could be addressed to either a male or a female. Now within that, we show that only 14 can in fact be confidently identified as being addressed to a man, and 13 more probably are because of their placing in the collection. We showed that only seven are addressed definitely to a woman, and that three more, because of their placing in the collection, might be. Now of the remaining um, sonnets, not, not included in those 121, 25 are meditations, personal meditations, little essays in miniature on Shakespeare's part, soliloquies. Six are addressed to abstract concepts, such as time or the muse, and those two at the end are translations. Within the 154 sonnets, we have identified 19 pairs of sonnets, which show that Shakespeare sometimes thought of the form facilitating a sequel these pairings are revealed through syntactical links and first words such as but, so, thus, or are, as it were, continuation words. And our chronological reordering has not separated any of the 1609 pairs of sonnets. So by detaching the traditional story from the poems, we enable, it, enable readers to see the sonnets as far more autobiographical than has previously been thought. Many of the sonnets are very personal poems, which we believe Shakespeare didn't actually want to be published. They're internal meditations, poems sometimes of anguished self-analysis, which show the difficulty of the situation, of the amorous situation in which the poet finds himself. Sometimes he writes about his own necessary death. Sometimes he meditates on, the, on time. Many of the sonnets seem to be revealing a very fragile relationship with other individuals. As we were looking at the sonnets, and we didn't set out to, to show this, we, we really discovered a bisexuality present among them. Now, one of the sonnets is very clearly about a bisexual relationship. That's Sonnet 144. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which, like two spirits, do suggest me still. The better angel is a man right fair, the worse a spirit, a woman coloured ill. Now what's happened, of course, is the traditional story has taken those two um, subjects mentioned in that sonnet and applied them to the rest of the collection, which is a very blunt thing to be doing. Let's look at two other love triangles within the collection, which might be both about different people in Shakespeare's life. They don't have to be about the same people mentioned in Sonnet 144. Why? Because they're written at different times. So the, the first love triangle occurs um, among sonnets 40 to 42, and then there's one amongst between sonnets, a pair of sonnets, 133 and 134. Now we're going to just look at sonnet 134. To say this is one of the most it's an example of one of Shakespeare's difficult sonnets, and there are many of these poems are difficult. Yeah, if we don't disguise that. So we're going to we're going to read. I'm going to read the thumbnail sketch. Um, it's one of a pair of sonnets. It 
both could be addressed to either a male or female and they're about a love triangle which allows for the possibility that that love triangle might be about three men. So here's our thumbnail sketch. You will go to any lengths to keep my friend and me in your power. I have lost him to your thrall and remain in your debt. So here's the whole sonnet. So now I have confessed that he is thine, and I myself am mortgaged to thy will, myself I'll forfeit, so that other mine thou wilt restore to be my comfort still. But thou wilt not, nor he will not be free, for thou art covetous, and he is kind. He learned but surety-like to write for me under that bond that him as fast doth bind. The statute of thy beauty thou wilt take, thou usurer, that putst forth all to use, and sue a friend came debtor for my sake. So him I lose through my unkind abuse. Him have I lost. Thou hast both him and me. He pays the whole, and yet am I not free. And here's our paraphrase of that sonnet. I have now admitted that my friend is yours, and that I am legally bound to obey you. I am willing to give myself up entirely to your power, if it means I can remain close to my other self, whom you have taken. But you will not give him back, nor does he wish to be free of you. You covet him, and he is good-natured. He has learnt to stand as security for me within the thrall of your beauty. You will take in full the amount I owe you, investing everything with interest and thereby suing my friend, who's placed himself into your debt because of me. Thus I lose, and have lost him through your unkind treatment of me. You now own both of us, and even though he bears the cost of everything, I'm still not free of the debt you hold against me. Notice the language of a businessman, a man of means, litigation, mortgages and money. Notice in line two, I am mortgaged to thy will, possibly alluding at the same time to Shakespeare's own first name as he does in sonnets 22, 57, 89, 135, 136 and 143 as well. So we find Shakespeare's personality and uh, the business side of Shakespeare as it were in that particular sonnet. As for the sonnets from the plays, they differ from each other in tone and in diction and in, in intelligibility from the sonnets of 1609, and also they differ among themselves. There are the formal prologues and epilogues, there are the more informal, intensely personal passages that we've already mentioned, Beatrice, Orlando, Cressida, for example. And we've come to dispute the often expressed view that the sonnets printed in 1609 are, as it were, trial runs for speeches in the plays, we think this is a way of evading the connections that the sonnets have to Shakespeare's own personal life. In turning over the traditional approach to, to the sonnets and showing the sonnets to be far more expressive of Shakespeare's inner life, we hope our new book plays its part in the rewriting of Shakespearean biography and that it changes the way we think about Shakespeare the man. In short, we hope that in this book we've changed the conversation about Shakespeare's sonnets forever. Thank you all for listening. Bye from Stratford-upon-Avon. All the best. Bye.